This is the Dibang Valley of Arunachal Pradesh. And if you and I don't pay very close attention, most of this could soon be gone. Now the forests you see on your screen are part of the richest province of biodiversity in the Himalayan range. This is the young eastern Himalayan range and it's also at the junction of Indo-Chinese, Indo-Malayan rainforests and we know we're seriously running out of rainforests in the world. These forests are home to almost mythical creatures that don't live anywhere else in the world. I mean, there are red pandas and there are Asiatic wild foxes, there's deer and there's this golden cat that's born in six different colors, which doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. And this guy, this goat antelope called the Misimi Tarkin, who's named after the local Iru Misimi tribe people, again, nowhere else in the world. In fact, these forests have butterflies and frogs and birds in the thousands. The scientists are still figuring out. In fact, it was only eight years ago that we found and scientists realized that tigers live in these forests. Here's proof of this photograph of tigers that live in this forest. They're called snow tigers because they live higher at a higher altitude than any of the other tigers in India and they're genetically slightly different from the rest of our tigers. So if we didn't know until 2012 that there were tigers in these forests, imagine what we don't know about these forests yet. Now you're going to wonder why I'm telling you any of this at all. Now these pristine forests that look like someone's screensaver and all of these animals will have to make way for an Italian power project which is being built by the state government and Jindal Power to generate 3,000 megawatts of power. It will also cost 2,70,000 trees, most of which are large old trees in what the government themselves are describing a subtropical, broad-leafed tropical rainforest. Well, now you're going to tell me that this is hardly the time, in the middle of the COVID crisis, to be bringing up the environment and projects that have nothing to do with it. You'd be absolutely right. But tell that to the Ministry of Forest and Environment. The Ministry has, in fact, been using the lockdown to push through permissions and clearances for large projects that will affect our forests. And one wonders why. Take a look at this tweet, for example, where the minister himself, the Union Minister for Forests and Environment, Mr. Prakash Javdekar, is talking about how he's used video conference to clear 11 large infrastructure projects in the matter of days in the middle of the lockdown. Like this is the most important thing that needs to be done. Now, what is the problem? You're going to say we all work from home, we're all using video conference. I'll tell you. In order to give permission to clear a forest, you have to first get a clearance from an expert committee. That is part of the process. And it's only after the expert committee gives its clearance that the Ministry of Environment can actually hand out its own clearance. Now, to do specifically with forests, that committee is called the Forest Advisory Committee. The Ministry has packed in schedules over the last couple of days with committees giving each of them about 10 minutes to clear 191 major projects across the country in almost a complete rush. Take a look at the schedule uploaded on the ministry website showing how many projects are being considered and one wonders why it's happening in such a hurry. Now the problem here is that people in these expert committees have told reporters that 10 minutes is not enough obviously to consider a project that has such major implications. They can't see the maps really on the video conference. They can't really read the documents that are being put forward. And of course, they can't make site visits. Also remember, in the middle of a lockdown, environmentalists and uh, organizers cannot exactly protest or have meetings right now to write out any sort of responses. So the ministry pushing through forest clearances is something we have to worry about. Now let's go back to the tiger who lives in the Dibang Valley and all of his endangered forest friends. Why is this a problem? On the 23rd of April, the Forest Advisory Committee considered this project, the Italian project that will come up in the Dibang Valley. Now, while recording this video on the 11th of May, we don't really know what the response of the FAC is, but we do understand from newspaper reports that the FAC has a, may have a favorable response. But, that aside, what we do know is that the research that was placed before the FAC is now public and everybody can read it. 
This actual project had gone before this committee several times in the past over the last 10 years and it had been rejected over and over again. In the last rejection, the committee had asked the Wildlife Institute of India to do a multi-seasonal study of the Dibang Valley to find out what the environment impact really will be. Now, because the study has now been uploaded on the website, environmentalists and scientists have been able to read that study. And they say the study is shocking. In fact, 24 scientists from 14 different organizations have written a review of that study because now they can see it, saying that it doesn't reflect the true picture of the Dibang Valley. It says, and these are scientists, botanists, ornithologists, mammologists, entomologists, who have written out saying that this entire study is false. It was supposed to be conducted over multi-seasons. It was conducted over just four months. It also goes on to say that it has understated the impact that the dam will have upstream and downstream. And worst of all, allegedly, it has mislabeled tiger territory and said that there are no tigers in the area where the dam will be built. To make matters worse, scientists that I have in fact spoken to have said that this area where the dam will be built, this valley, these mountains are prone to landslides and they are also on a very careful level 5 earthquake zone. So large construction of this kind, of these dams, of India's highest dams in these mountains could cause earthquakes and landslides. So to say that the impact will only be in the actual catchment area of the dam might not be true because it could cause entire hillsides to collapse. Let's take a look at both sides of the story and understand what the government's reasons could be to fast track development of dams, particularly in this very sensitive area. I also wanted to point out here that these dams were actually planned out and started and inaugurated by previous governments. They're being fast tracked and permissions are being pushed by this government now. Now, one of the reasons is development in Arunachal Pradesh for the people who live there. They deserve the schools and the hospitals and the roads that you and I enjoy. It takes them a great deal of effort to reach the nearest hospital. Secondly, is the generation of uh, electricity. And third, is the stemming of flooding of the Brahmaputra that happens every year in this particular part of the country. Now, rebuttals that are being uh, offered right now by environmentalists and scientists are these. It is possible to give the people of Arunachal Pradesh roads and schools and electricity and hospitals without completely devastating the environment. Why do we actually have to build dams? Secondly, as far as hydroelectric power is concerned, it is now widely accepted across the world that hydroelectric power is not clean energy. It's not clean power because of the kind of environmental devastation that it causes. And finally, as far as the flooding is concerned, the people of Assam have actually come out and protested dams on the Dibang Valley because they believe it puts them and their crops and their wildlife in their wildlife sanctuary at risk downstream if these dams were to ever be opened and water were to be allowed to flow through in the monsoon months. On a side note, that protest in Assam is being led by respected activist Akhil Gogoi who happens to still be in jail after CAA and that's a different reason to worry. But coming back to the Dibang Valley and the people and the animals that live there, what do we need now? In, I'm sure the government has its reasons, but its reasons cannot be based on faulty science. If so many scientists believe that the report placed before the FAC is faulty, then that report must be junked. We have to also remember that India is a key signatory right now to many international pacts and treaties on the environment, including the Global Tiger Initiative, the Convention of Biodiversity, and we committed to sustainable development goals in the UN in 2012. Now, sustainable development goals quite clearly says that hydroelectricity is no longer clean energy. What do we do? We need to ask the Environment Ministry to do a few things for us. First of all, do not push through permissions like this in the middle of a lockdown when there isn't enough information and there isn't enough time to consider the implications. Because once forests are chopped up, they cannot be regenerated. This idea of afforestation or starting to plant trees elsewhere is not the same thing when we talk about dense rainforests like this one. Secondly, throw out the report that's being put before the FAC on the Dibang Valley and the Italian project and commission a new report. And finally, at a time when the entire world is in lockdown, 
because we messed with the environment and with wildlife. And we realize that a mistake made in one part of the world is a price we all have to pay. We can no longer make mistakes like this with the environment.